Back at Life Stories with me, New York Hagram. Today we're joined by Mark Elaine. How you doing, Mark? Yeah, I'm pretty good. Um, there's some, some live sport on, keeping busy. Um, yeah, all good. Yeah, cricket's back. A little bit of normality. Um, but yeah, let's let's start where it all began for yourself. So you were actually born um, in London, North London. Yeah. But then you went back to Barbados, where you spent the majority of your childhood and early teens before coming back to the UK. Can you just talk through um, your earliest memories um, and how you got into cricket? Yeah, sure thing. So um, my, my parents came over uh, individually uh, and they met in England, um, I think during the, the kind of wind rush time, early 60s. And they, they met and kind of hooked up in England and started a family in England. Had an elder brother who's about three and a half years older than I am. Um, however, when I was about four years old, uh, they decided uh, to move back to Barbados. So um, the family all went back to Barbados and I lived there for about 11 years um, before returning to uh, England at 15. So um, how I got into cricket, I guess, is it's really simple. Um, living in Barbados uh, in the 70s and 80s, you know, cricket was in the muscle of of everyone. I mean, they loved it. The team were doing really well. Everyone played, everyone talked about it. It was a real vibrant cricket um, community. And that's where I fell in love with the game. Who were your heroes whilst you were growing up? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, I started watching cricket live probably late primary, early secondary school. And Gordon Greenwich and Desmond Haynes were not just the opening batters for Barbados, but also for the West Indies. So they, you know, I, I followed, I made sure I can get in to watch them bat. And uh, I love the way they play the game. Uh, lots of flair, um, aggression. It was good to watch. So, yeah, I think those top order batters were, were my early heroes, yeah. And then when you were in the UK, you actually played for Middlesex under-17 and under-19? before trialling for, for Gloucester. Can you just talk a little bit about that period? Yeah, so it was a, a tricky period coming back to England. Um, uh, obviously, I, I was spoiled with quite a lot of cricket in Barbados. Came back to England and my school in Hackney uh, didn't play cricket at all. So I had to kind of get my fix, if you like, um, outside of school. And uh, I was fortunate enough to, to kind of be recommended to, to London schools and, and did quite well at their kind of under 15, under 16 age group. And London schools, I guess, was a good kind of scouting ground for the, for the Middlesex um, age groups. And I managed to get into the uh, Middlesex under 17 side and under 19 when I was still quite young. Uh, I was doing quite well for them. And I guess it was only those representative times that I thought, oh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty decent at this. I'll keep, I'll keep going and see what happens. And then you trialled for, for loss. I think you accompanied your, your big brother down there. Um, yeah, that's right. So, there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the same time all this was happening, um, we were very fortunate that um, the Harringay Council decided to fund a really interesting initiative to help young cricketers um, practice, train, develop. And my brother was um, the first captain of that group and really good cricketer. And uh, through his performances for the cricket college, he got invited up to Gloucestershire for trial. And, um, you know, like a loyal little brother does, you know, I followed him up there because very often you'd be up there for three or four days. It was um, nice to come to Bristol for a bit and see him play. And I, I eventually... Um, by nature of being around so much, got dragged into one of the second 11 games and did well. Then got officially invited back, continued to do well until um, I was offered a, a, a three-year contract for Gloucestershire. Yes, yeah, so how would you sum up your early professional days? I know I was looking up some stats, I think in 86, when you were 18, you got 100 in your eighth game at such a young age. Then a few years later, um, and double hundred as well. Um, how would you sum up on where your game was at that stage early in your career? 
I, I, I do have to look back calm at those days because the cricketer I finished up, you know, wasn't the cricketer that kind of entered the professional arena. I mean, back in those days, I kept wicket quite a lot. Um, I saw myself as a batting wicketkeeper. Um, and certainly it was only because of uh, no real opportunities with Jack Russell at, at Gloucestershire that I started to, to bowl a little bit. But my main strength was my batting. Uh, and like you said, you know, quite early on, it was my first game at Bristol. I got 100 against Sussex. And um, that was really, as you would imagine, a real joyful moment for me. I mean, one, it was my first 100, but it was also against Sussex who had Iman Khan in the ranks. And uh, I do remember when I was playing um, with my brother, we used to have a game called Marble Cricket. We used to play in the lounge. And he obviously had first dibs at which team he's going to be. He was the West Indies and his second team was England. So I was Pakistan and India. Uh, so Imran Khan was, was a real hero of mine in my marble cricket days. And I couldn't believe I was playing against him. And, um, you know, I'm not massively nostal nostalgic, but the one picture I have kept was me walking off, raising my back and Imran Khan in the background. Uh, clapping me off and that, that's a real big moment in my early cricket days and then in 97 you got made the skipper and we're going to talk about it you obviously a huge period of success especially in the the shorter format the one day game but when you got made the captain did you see yourself as a natural leader did captaincy come easy to you well uh, I, I captained all through my um school days um when i was at school in barbados the main competition there was an under 15 comp called ronald tree and it's the schoolboy competition that everyone wanted to win and uh the year i was captain for for harrison college in that comp we we actually won the competition so i kind of got recognized there obviously firstly to be selected as captain but then i had early success in my first year so it's something i've always enjoyed um and I think it's the, it's the thing that drove me to, to wicketkeeping as well, because I like to be involved in the game. I like to see, you know, every ball that's in the game, I want to be part of it. And um, I think that kind of helped develop my, um, my captaincy, certainly my strategic skills. Um, and uh, the, the leadership stuff, I think, is something that could be learned. And uh, as I went through my career, I learned of different senior players as I as I developed my own career. Yeah, let me say we talked about the success '99, the Ben uh, the Benson Hedges and the Nat West Trophy, 2000, the treble, the One Day Cup, CNG and Benson and Hedges. Then a few years later, 2003, the CNG and 2004. I know you were also yeah. the head coaches as well, mm -hmm. the CNG. But initially, during that period, the the initial success. How what was your relationship like with? Uh, the coach, uh, John Bracewell, the captain and coach relationship, a huge part of the success, yeah. success reason for success? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, anyone would testify, you, you can't do anything uh, on your own. Um, what you can do, you can try and influence how things happen around you. And um, we were really fortunate, um, and I say fortunate, but I don't really mean that because uh, we, we made a real effort to try and get the right person uh, to leave Gloucestershire because we felt as though we were stagnating a bit and um, the players were really vociferous about this um, amongst ourselves. We talked a lot about it and uh, I managed to convince uh, the chief exec and the committee to um, not just um, appoint a coach but can we, I mean it wasn't common in those days that you would interview for the coaching role. These roles were handed to people um, I, I really don't know how the decision process was made, but it's by, by committees, I think. Anyway, we had a rigorous um, interview um, scenario where John Bracewell came out comfortably on top as the leading candidate and accepted our terms. And when he arrived, you know, it was really a breath of a fresh air. You know, he had a, a real strong cricketing pedigree himself, but he brought that kind of antipodean kind of uh, abruptness, if you like, um, to what was uh, a fairly gentle 
Gloucestershire side. Um, and I think that the, the dynamic really worked well. And do you think as a one-day team, you were kind of ahead of your times, the way um, you give roles to specific players? You kind know, of great players up top, Kim Barnett, then Ian Harvey, yourself, Jack Russell, as mentioned, behind the stumps, uh, John Lewis with the ball. Um, is it, would that be a fair statement to make, that you were a little bit ahead uh, of your times? Well, uh, there, there were areas that we looked at that we knew were untouched uh, at the time. Uh, in cricket, it's very stat-based and certain stats stand out kind of larger than some. And uh, quite naturally, players aspire to the stats that people take notice of. And um, before you know it, you know, subconsciously, that's what you focus all your attention on. However, um, John Bracewell, um, and supported by myself, were really keen on the, the stats that people don't really see, you know, like some of the off the ball stuff uh, and making the team really um, strong in the unrecognised areas. Um, just look at I mean, the fielding kind of stood out for a start. Uh, there are not many fielding stats apart from how many catches you took. And that really isn't that relevant because it's more about the percentage of catches you take, not the amount. Um, but we started looking at how, how people were saving singles and um, can you save, you know, two or three runs and in innings. Um, and this is not guys just in, in the cover or mid-wicket area. We're talking about guys in the outfield. And we started positioning guys who were brilliant at doing that kind of stuff. So we started specialising in areas that people didn't often specialise in before. And the demand was that all 11 players had, you know, this capacity. And if you can save a run within the group, it is really welcome and acknowledged. And then one player I didn't mention, um, Jeremy Snape. Yeah. He's gone on now to become a, um, a well-known uh, sports psychologist. Yeah. So did he kind of bring that mindset whilst as a player? And kind of, did he influence the kind of the changes in thinking? Well, I think this is a skill set that Jeremy kind of developed afterwards. Uh, what Jeremy did bring, um, which was kind of what I was talking about, he was a, a skillful batter, uh, although he didn't get a lot of plaudits for how well he can bat. Um, but that was by nature, batting in the middle order um, and not getting enough opportunity. And obviously as a bowler, um, in first class cricket wasn't prolific, but as a one day bowler, he really understood the, the kind of nuances of the game and um, was, a, was a smart cookie. So he added a dimension to all cricket that we didn't have at the time. And that was a really good fit for us. Um, and I think we, we fed off each other a lot in terms of the psychology of the game. Um, we, we recognised that it was a, an area you can add real value. And he obviously pursued it further, kind of got formally qualified after he finished playing and, and took it from there. And then parallel to this period, you also uh, got capped for England um, in 1999. You made your debut uh, first of 10 one-dayers. A proud moment for yourself? Debut against Australia? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean... I, all through the uh, kind of 90s, if you like, uh, when I was playing probably my best cricket, I was really hopeful of an of a earlier England call. And in some ways, I thought that moment had gone. So um, when I, I was in the touring squad, I was certainly rejuvenated and thought, you know, I have got another chance to, to have a good go at the international game. And um, I did, did really well in the, the warm-ups leading up to that first ODI. I managed to get myself in the starting 11. And, um, you know, it was, a, it was a really good day in a lot of ways. Um, personally, I didn't score many runs. I had a bit of a mishap in, in the field, early part of the field. But then that made up for, for a good run out when I ran Shane Warner. But it was a brilliant day because we beat... Australia in Brisbane, which um, I saw last year when England beat them in Brisbane, it was the first time they did it since then. So um, it's not an easy thing to do. 
So that was really proud moment. And would the standout moment be um, the three for and the 50 you got against South Africa in East London? Yeah, I was uh, really starting to find my feet then. Uh, South Africa, obviously a really good side on their own soil as well. And um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that series actually. Um, I had a, a nice battle with, uh, with Lance Klusner, who was recognised as one of the power hitters of the time. But he just had a slight kind of timing problem with me. And uh, I was tasked to bowl at him every time he came in. And uh, I've got to say, I, I think I did, I did quite well um, in the kind of head-to-head. -head. And that gave me a lot of confidence because he was recognised as the leading all round in kind of world cricket at the time in one day stuff. Uh, but that particular game, um, it was a good, great game. Uh, I loved it. Uh, I, I don't think we won it in the end. But um, I saw some sporting moments in that game, uh, particularly from John T. Rhodes. The game was getting quite tight. And um, I remember doing a dive and stop at mid-off. And he took, he, it was off him, he was batting. He took time to applaud me, you know, in a tense moment of the game. And I thought, gosh. You know, some people really do play cricket the right way. And um, ever since then, he, he's been a, a kind of late hero of mine. So, um, in fact, we eventually signed him at Gloucestershire because I just liked the way he played the game with such enthusiasm and such authenticity. It was great. And then also the national team recognised your leadership capabilities. You captained um, several um, England A tours. Um, yeah. Proud moment again, and who were the players that were underneath you on those tours? Oh, uh, I'm going to have to rewrap my brain now. But th yeah, those moments were great because it was um, a balance of kind of four-day and one-day cricket. And um, we played in the West Indies first-class uh, season. That was uh, quite different. Um, and I uh, did quite well there. Um, but the standout really, I think, was the Bangladesh-New Zealand tour. Um, where I not only did well with the team, but personally, I think I was voted the, the kind of voter phone batter of the of the tour, um, which I, you know, was really proud of um, because they had batters in there like Vikram Solanke, Marcus Triscothic, um, I think Ronnie Irani was on that tour, um, Usman Afzal, Ian Ward. Uh, some really good batters that went on to play test cricket and uh, had good test careers. So, um, yeah, that was a really proud moment. And then back on the domestic front, I know we touched on it before, but when John Bracewell left uh, to coach New Zealand, you became the player coach. How did you find that transition? I know you said we got the, you got the trophy in 2004 as a CNG, but that initial transition, did you find that difficult? Um, yeah, it was difficult uh, for reasons probably not massively cricket related. Uh, my whole life was transitioning at the time. Um, I, I decided, um, I mean, I had got married in uh, 98 and we were going to start a family and um, started a family in 04. So, so now the dynamics were starting to change. You know, I had three young children on, under the age of 15 months. and um, so my whole life was changing. I, was, uh, I started a master's degree, so I was starting to think about what I'm going to do post-cricket. Um, so yeah, that transition to, to coach was, was tricky, but I don't think it was the major change as, a, as opposed to some of the other things that were going on in my life. And then how would you sum up the, the back end of your career when you retired and then becoming the full-time coach exclusively? before leaving in 2008? How would you sum it up? Yeah, uh, a little, little bit untidy, um, if I like. Um, my, my vision was to uh, relinquish the captaincy and have a year or at least two um, still playing, still performing at first class level and kind of bowing out that way. So I, I felt, when I say untidy, um, it was quite hastened um, the end of my career because I think more responsibility came my way at a time maybe I wanted to just regress for a bit because the previous eight years have been 
have been tough and challenging. Um, so in hindsight, maybe I could have had a, a little bit of a break before attacking the next kind of uh, stage of my career. Um, so yeah, that was a bit untidy, but nonetheless, it was a challenge I couldn't deny and um, I loved it. It was great. Yes, and when you left Gloucester, you had a little time as the coach of the MCC. But then, has, has opportunity ever come for you again to get back into the game at the highest level? Right, so um, not quite. Um, so as I said, I, I got rushed into, um, I was doing a, a master's degree when I was offered uh, the head coach role. And it was, it was um, because uh, Graham Ford was offered to take over from John Bracewell. And just before the season start, he, um, they couldn't reach an agreement. So we were left stuck. So I agreed to do it until we can get someone in and kind of end up having to do it for a bit longer than I wanted, which meant I put my master's on hold and had to qualify with my coaching papers, level three, level four, which, you know, quite time consuming. So um, once I did that, um, I added some kind of, I guess, theoretical knowledge to my practical experience. And um, I thought that would make me a more um, all encompassing coach. So when I left Gloucestershire, I thought coaching at what I would call academy level um, at the MCC Young Cricketers was a good place to apply a lot of the stuff I've kind of learned um, to young aspiring first class cricketers. And I thought two or three years there will put me in a good place to attack the first class scene again. Um, but that's where it kind of fell down. It was hard to really get back into the counties. Um, I did try, um, but I ended up at MCC for seven years. I uh, had really good fun there. Lots of good young cricketers coming through. We had 29 that made it to first class cricket in seven years, which was kind of above average at the time. So um, I thought I was doing a really good job. Um, but then, you know, I live in, in Bristol, working in London, young family. It didn't quite mix very well so i made a decision to to move, get back to the southwest so i had to leave my lord's role uh, and that's why i ended up um in the school as a kind of cricket professional uh, to start with um and i'm now doing the kind of assistant director of sport role there um, at marble college which is really fulfilling really satisfying um great bunch of guys there and there's a lot more to to come from me Yes, yeah, so when I was um, doing a little bit of research as well, um, something that I read which kind of blew my mind a little bit is that um, in terms of a British black coach, you're the only one in the last century. That's a crazy thing I read. Um, a word from yourself on that? Yeah, I, I thought it was quite staggering at the time because when you're doing it, um, I, I didn't see myself necessarily as a black coach, I saw myself as a coach who earned the right um, to, to get that role through um, a lot of the other stuff I've done. Um, it's only in, um, as you look back, um, you think, gosh, you know, um, there don't seem to be enough opportunity um, and incentive uh, for black coaches to, to get into the game. And, uh, you know, it's not all the employer's fault um, because um, that more black people need to go and get themselves qualified uh, as coaches, which I understand is something that is going to be happening now. And once they get themselves in the mix, I hope that the opportunity will arise to, to coach at the highest level. Are there any roles that you particularly applied for that you didn't get and that you would want to disclose? Well, I mean, there are lots of roles, but, you know, I'm no, no different to all the other coaches out there who are, who are fighting to, to get into the first-class game. Um, as you can imagine, you, you can't say for sure why you're being denied an opportunity, and I, I would hate to speculate um, until you know for sure. 
Um, so I've always thought, you know, I've got no divine right necessarily to, to hold down a particular role. Um, but what I would like is the opportunity to show what I can do. I feel as though I've got a good record behind me, um, coaching and playing, um, and in, in the leadership role. So uh, I thought the, uh, the combination of those attributes maybe should lend itself to some opportunity. And um, I've been unfortunate applying for some roles that went to, went to other people. But like I say, I'm, I'm not the only person that's been, been turned down for roles in, in their life. And then how do you see the game as a whole on the field? Um, obviously, England, home World Cup success in the 50 over format last year a bit up and down in the test arena how do, how do you how do you view things currently at home and internationally as well well um the, the good thing is um the england team are, are great to watch which um you've got to remember it, it is a sport it is entertainment and um if you want people to to stay in the sport I think teams need to be kind of good to watch. And uh, most people that I know, including myself, like watching England play at the moment. You know, they've got a good dynamic um, of players, you know, some swashbuckling batters, pacey bowlers, um, you know, skills right throughout the side in, in the test and one day um, in the test and one day teams. So you know that over a period of time, they are going to beat some teams and beat them badly. And um, I think they're just looking for that more consistency now, I guess, at test level. But they're, they're good to watch. So Mark, brilliant. Really appreciate your time. Great chatting about your career. And yeah, all the best um, for the months coming up. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, yeah, let's hope we have a end of summer cricket festival, if you like. We yeah. loads to talk about. It'll be great. Yeah, fingers crossed. So Neil Kagram, Cricket Last Ways, Mark Elaine, thank you.